Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the class we are about to have. God, we pray that as we listen to the class, you will help us to open our mind and heart and listen to it and understand the deep truths that are being taught to us by Pastor Deepika. We bless her, God. But we pray that we won't just listen to the words, but we will be doers of the word. We'll be someone who walk in your holiness, in your righteousness, in the things that you have did for us, Jesus. Be with us, help us to understand. Holy Spirit, you guide us, you lead us, Lord. And we pray for good Wi-Fi connection throughout the session. I pray for all my classmates. Be with us and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so um We've kind of come into the last few sessions, you know, of our topic, um, which is living in holiness, learning to overcome, and um, you know, maintaining the standards that God has set for us, so that we can live in a way that is honorable to Him. Uh, so we, um, after having discussed so many different things, we finally came to uh, the, you know, the three main concluding uh, practical. Uh, topics of overcoming the uh, flesh, overcoming the world, and overcoming the devil. So we have finished overcoming the flesh. Uh, we covered that over two sessions. Uh, so um, last week, we kind of started off with overcoming the world. Uh, we, in fact, did spend some time looking at it. Uh, but you know, we'll, we'll finish the topic today. And we'll also begin with the third one, which is overcoming the devil. Uh, so, um, in your notes, there are some uh, practical points given about how we overcome the world. And um, we looked at the first point, uh, which was to set our desires on things above. Uh, we looked at, at it in some detail. Uh, so, we have a few more points to go. Uh, you know, all of these points are there. Uh, the scripture references and the points are mentioned in your notes. Uh, so, we'll right now. Uh, look at the second uh, point on how to be an overcomer in overcoming the world. Uh, so the second point in your notes uh, is basically uh, the importance of staying sanctified by the word and the spirit. Uh, so we know that uh, God uses the word, the Bible, the scriptures. He uses the scriptures and he uses his Holy Spirit to sanctify us, to set us apart so that we are different from the rest of the world. So uh, these are the two main instruments that the Lord uses in setting us apart. So it would be good if we can pay attention to these two things. You know, the word of God, um, uh, learn to, um, first of all, learn what it says and then uh, learn to practice it. And the other, the Holy Spirit, because he's the one who leads us and guides us and shows us in which direction to go. So these two things mainly are what God uses uh, to, um, to set us apart from the rest of the world so that we are not going in the direction that the world is going. Um, so um, if we could have one person read out John chapter 17, verses 14 to 20. Uh, because there are a couple of nice things that we see said in this passage. John 17, 14 to 20, please. John chapter 17, verse 14 to 20. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them for, from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you send me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. Uh, yeah. So over here, Jesus says, I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. So because our human representative, the perfect representative, Jesus, he was able to sanctify himself. He was able to keep himself apart. Now, through his spirit, through his Holy Spirit, we also will be able to do the same thing if we place our faith in him. So he is not asking us to do something impossible. 
it is something that he has already achieved and uh, so when we place ourselves under his covering and we choose to learn from him he imparts this skill to us as well so in the same way that he sanctified himself and he went to the cross and accomplished uh, all that is required you know for us to be able to live a victorious life so in the same way he set himself apart and did those things for us now through him through faith in him we too will be able to live sanctified lives and how exactly is the sanctification brought about you know in this prayer jesus prays uh, you know i'm not asking you to take them out of the world but lord you know he says protect them from the evil one and how does god protect us from the evil one it says in uh, verse 17 sanctify them you know set them apart by the truth your word is truth so he he protects us from the evil one through his word his word is like a compass it shows us in which direction we should be going um so because we have uh, many earthly responsibilities to fulfill you know we we looked at the three main things that, that the world stands for you know the term world what it stands for in you know, biblically and we looked at one of the things um that the world represents is all the cares and responsibilities and the pressures that we have so we the natural instinct is for us to you know go hurrying about the entire day trying to catch up on all the things that need to be done but when we have the holy spirit leading and when we have the word of god leading they serve like a compass they tell us okay now you go in this direction you know go and fulfill that responsibility but now no now it's time for you to go into my presence go and spend time in my presence so it helps actually uh, when we choose to uh, you know um, when we choose to plan out our lives schedule our uh, you know our various uh, duties and responsibilities in leading uh, you know by through the leading of the holy spirit and the word of god uh, we kind of will ha end up having a more balanced lifestyle so the holy spirit and scripture are able to make sure that uh, we are moving in the correct direction and pleasing the lord through our lifestyle the third point in your notes uh, is it talks about living by faith with a renewed mind and uh, you know we are very familiar with second corinthians 5 7 which says live by faith uh, for we live by faith not by sight um so uh this point you know it applies more to the um to the other aspect of the world the world also represents all the hardships and the trials and the difficulties that we go through so when we are going through those pressures and difficulties rather than becoming anxious rather than allowing those things to you know um, make us feel disappointed to an extent where we just go away from god rather than allowing that to happen you know we choose to live by faith because you know romans 8:28 talks uh, talks about how in all things god works for the good of those who love him so even when things are going completely wrong we choose to believe you know we choose to live by faith we choose to believe that even in these negative things that are taking place even in all these things god is working for the good of those who love him uh, and it also says who have been called according to his purpose so god has called us according to his purpose with a specific plan so even though things are going badly he is working out his purpose he is he has called us for something so he will fulfill that calling and so now we choose to live by faith uh, we choose to continue renewing our minds and telling our minds no it's all right even though things are going negatively right now even in these negative circumstances that i'm facing right now uh, god is at work and he is working to fulfill that calling that he has you know because he has called us according to his purpose so that's the assurance that romans 8 28 gives uh, so uh, god does not take away trials and difficulties but he helps us to overcome those and um, you know first peter 1 6 to 7 uh, which we have looked at earlier but then you know if we could just uh, read that once more as a reminder to ourselves if someone could read out first peter 1 6 to 7 please
1 Peter chapter 1 verses 6 to 7 In this you greatly rejoice though now for a little while if need be you have been grieved by various trials that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than the gold that perishes though it is tested by fire may be found to praise honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ yeah so the reason that god operates in this way the reason he allows these trials and difficulties is because it builds us up in the faith for him um, our faith is more precious and more important than all the treasures in heaven you know because um, uh, our faith shows him that we are trusting him that in spite of all the things that are happening we still believe in him that we still hope in him and so that is why our these trials to uh, to show you know all the principalities and powers that see even though all these trials are coming into the lives of my uh, children look at the faith that they have in me you know they're still holding on to me so it results in praise and glory and honor you know uh, uh, for the name of the lord jesus when he is finally revealed so um, this is something uh, so we, so we, when we are going through trials we can tell ourselves you know this is happening because god knows that i will continue trusting him so by you know holding on to him in these trials i am proving to him that i really believe in him and one day you know the lord's name will be glorified because i'm responding with trust i really believe that even in these negative things god is working uh, you know uh, for the good uh you know of his kingdom and for my personal good so we choose to believe these things and as we are believing it our faith gets stronger and stronger and then it's demonstrated to everyone you know how trustworthy our god is and god gets honored because of the trust that we have placed in him and uh, so you know like it says in first john 5 4 it is our faith which overcomes the world you know that's what it says in first john 5 4 this is the victory that has overcome the world even our faith uh, so we choose to believe you know like it says in romans 8:37 that we are more than conquerors through him in even the most difficult and and you know um, most impossible situations we choose to continue believing that we will be oh, conquerors that he will bring us out of those situations and even as we live in that way um, you know our our faith uh, is the seed through which the victory comes because we are we are refusing to believe you know that we will be drowned by those difficulties we are refusing to believe that the the calling of our life will be crushed out because of those difficulties because we refuse to believe those falsehoods because we are holding on to the truth and believing that yes through him we will have victory because we are asserting ourselves in that way you know um god will indeed work out all things for our good so uh, another way of overcoming the world is we renew our minds daily and we choose to live by faith and then there's another point mentioned in your uh, notes uh, which is which says be spiritually minded and earthly wise because that's one way of overcoming the world um and uh, matthew 10 16 is the verse that has been given for this point you know if someone could read out for us matthew 10 verse 16 matthew 10 verse 16 i'm sending you out like sheep among wolves therefore be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves so it is important uh, that we should you know be holy even as god is holy so we stay innocent as doves we do not do anything crooked you know to overcome the world we don't use crooked tactics uh, to overcome the world we remain innocent as doves but at the same time we you know choose to be clever we choose to be wise with the wisdom that god has given us he has given common sense to everyone it is very very vital to use the common sense that god has given and also this divine wisdom which god imparts when we are in in difficult situations so we need to use that wisdom to be really very very wise um why because we are going to be living among wolves 
we are not going to be living in a safe place where everyone only has our good in their hearts no we are going to be living in a very crooked world where everyone wants to work against us so yes we choose to remain holy we choose to be as innocent as doves when it comes to you know crooked schemes crooked methods no so we don't resort to those things rather we look to god and we say lord i'm living in this very very evil world now you give me your heavenly wisdom to deal with these situations that i am facing so when we uh, you know uh, have that kind of an attitude um, in in fact it says in roman 16 19 to 20 um, yeah if someone could read out romans 16 19 to 20 Romans chapter sixteen verses nineteen to twenty. For your obedience has become known to all. Therefore, I am glad on your behalf. But I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Yeah. So over here, you know, Paul says, everyone has heard about your obedience. You are people who choose to. Uh, follow what scripture is telling you know and that's the right way to be because you know this actually this passage is uh, in the context of false teachings so there were false teachers coming and you know um le- trying to lead people away from the truth but these romans were trying to be careful they were trying to obey what is scripturally correct rather than being led away by these false teachers you know um and so he says that's a really good thing that you are doing and so he says be wise in good things you know what the scripture says that's the way to conduct yourself in the world the world uses all kinds of crooked means and methods to you know get their jobs done you don't need to be like that you be wise about what is good choose to continue you know following scriptural um, methods um so be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil so don't be like the world which is uh, you know using crookedness uh, to to get what they require you be innocent about those things so even as you hold on to the lord with the right attitude god himself the god of peace himself will crush satan under your feet so you don't have to go around doing crooked things you know to get the job done you just hold on to the truth you use the godly wisdom that god imparts to you in these difficult situations and even as you continue to do what is right uh, you know through his divine wisdom he himself will personally crush satan on your behalf you know is what uh, uh, so um, uh, luke 16:8 talks about you know um, worldly uh, wisdom not godly wisdom but worldly wisdom uh if you know if someone could read out luke 16:8 luke 16:8 the master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly for the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light yeah so this is an observation that jesus makes he gives a story in which uh crooked methods you know leads to some level of um, success uh, so uh, in this particular story we have a manager who is supposed to be managing the business of the owner um, so i mean I, i suppose you know they're selling some kind of goods or commodities or something and all these people who are supposed to pay you know uh, once you get your you know your consignment you're supposed to pay for it but then all these people have been rather careless in making their payments and even this manager also has been rather lazy he's not followed up with them he's not collected the payments and then when the master gets to know about this he is extremely angry and so he you know he says and i want to see the accounts i want to see the figures how much you know loss have you cost me up to now so this manager he very cleverly starts changing the accounts you know so that it shows like as if if someone owes him you know maybe 10000 um he he makes it look like as if that person actually owed only 5000 so there's some kind of illegal understanding made between that uh, the person the customer and this manager so the customer benefits because he only has to pay a smaller amount now and the manager he he can show like as if you know the the loss was uh, lesser than it actually was so he resorts this to this kind of crookedness 
and it says over here when the manager get um, the, when the owner of the business gets to know about this he says oh that's a clever way of dealing with it so in fact he kind of you know compliments the crooked thing that has been done and then jesus says when these with these people of the world they are more you know clever in dealing with their own kind they know how to manipulate they know uh, you know how to um, you know um, twist the truth uh, to to achieve whatever they want and the people of the light are you know the people of the light the people of god tend to be a bit innocent about these things you know it's is the observation that uh, that god makes over here so over here in this story is jesus saying that we should use crooked methods definitely not because jesus is you no know, he says i am the way the truth uh, so he would he would never ask us to resort to something crooked but what jesus is pointing out is that we are living in a very evil world where in fact evil is praised where in fact evil is commended and glorified we are living in that kind of a setup so in such a setup it becomes even more important for us to move in you know uh, divine wisdom to use one example you know of paul um when he was um, you know this happens in acts chapter 22 Verses twenty-one to twenty-nine. You know, which is like a bit of a lengthy story. But over here in Acts twenty-two, twenty-one to twenty-nine, um, this is this is happening in Ephesus, where you know the people, the Ephesian people, are very very upset because their uh, pagan religions are losing importance. A lot of people are becoming believers, and so they are very upset about it. And um, so at that point of time, um, they. yeah you know so uh, uh, paul begins to explain um well, i'm not sure whether this is the ephesian story or not probably not no this is not the ephesian incident this seems to be happening in um, jerusalem okay but yeah uh, so uh, in in this uh, you know passage um paul starts explaining why he is you know uh, giving the message to the uh, to the gentiles and why he is trying to bring them into the kingdom of god so he starts explaining that and the crowd gets really angry and they you know um, uh, get ready to attack so at that time the commander of the you know the roman commander who is supposed to maintain peace in the city who can't allow all these kind of rebellions to be happening so he comes along and he asks that paul should be flogged and we see that in acts 22 verse 25 onwards um if you know if you if someone could just read out acts 22 25 and 26 acts 22 25 and 26 as they stretched him out to flog him paul paul said to the centurion standing there is it legal for you to flog a roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty when the centurion heard this he went to the commander and reported it what are you going to do he asked this man is a roman citizen the commander yes. went yeah no no that's all right uh, so at that point when uh, you know paul could have uh, been very badly uh, beaten up god gives him this uh, divine idea you know so he he god says to him probably you know why don't you use your roman citizenship to you know get out of this particular situation and so he speaks up and he says you know i am a roman citizen and you people are getting ready to flog me now isn't that illegal i can actually take legal action against you for what you are doing right now and the, once the centurion gets to know about that he immediately goes running to the commander and says you know what you've given the order for a roman citizen to get flogged and it's pretty dangerous thing to do because you see that this uh, commander in fact he had to buy his roman citizenship so uh, uh, on the other hand paul never even had to do make any purchases he was literally born with a roman citizenship you know because of the particular place where he would have been born so um so um so paul uses this strategy at this particular point of time to deal with the world so in times of crisis it is good for us to say to the lord lord we are living among wolves you have sent us among wolves so yes i will follow the scriptures and i will stay as innocent as a dove but also lord could you give me the divine wisdom i need to handle the situation in the correct manner 
so that I can be as shrewd as a snake, because that's the instruction you gave. So Lord, I really do want to be as shrewd as a snake when dealing with the worldly people. Show me what to do. Show me how to handle it. And the Lord can actually you know, provide us with some um, idea uh, where we can actually um, overcome that particular situation. So these are just some of the points that are there in your notes about how we can be people who overcome the world. So even though the world is working against us, um, uh, we can actually, uh, with the help of God, overcome the world and be victorious. So we have, in fact, now covered overcoming the flesh and overcoming the world. Um, we'll quickly get into our you know, um, third main uh, chapter, which is overcoming the devil. Uh, so when it comes to overcoming Satan, um, we first of all have to understand and fully absorb the fact that we are dealing with someone who has been completely and thoroughly defeated. Now, if this fundamental uh, fact, this fundamental truth is not established in our minds, you know, we would be uh, fearful. Uh, we would wonder whether we really can have victory. And, you know, we have all these negative thoughts coming into our minds. And so the very first thing about overcoming the devil is that we should be so clear in our minds that we are dealing with someone who is completely defeated. Because when we can recognize this basic fact, it gives us the confidence, you know, to use Jesus' name and uh, by his authority to get things done. On the other hand, if we are not very clear about what the what our status is, our legal status is, you know, and what Satan's legal status is, uh, we can actually get, kind of get um, you know led in the wrong direction, and we can end up in defeat unnecessarily. Uh, so um, maybe we could read out. Or maybe we could start by reading out First Corinthians chapter two, verses six to eight. First Corinthians two six to eight, please. This Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 to 8. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages of our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Okay, so... We have now started off, uh, you know, this topic by looking at a passage which talks about how these rulers of the age were very limited in their wisdom and their knowledge, very, very limited. And so they thought they were coming up with a very great scheme, but actually the scheme which they tried to come up with totally backfired. OK, so it really helps to understand the background, why we are saying that Satan is just defeated, he's useless. He cannot really stand up against us once we understand the authority that we have. So in here in this in the passage, it talks about how the rulers of this age, who are the, who are the spiritual rulers of this age? You know, they are the dark forces, uh, Satan and his fallen angels, who have been given temporary authority for a temporary amount of time. Uh, so they are the ones who are ruling this age. And look at what 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6 says about them. It says, um, uh, we speak a message uh, of wisdom among the mature, not the wisdom of the age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. These rulers of this age, they are literally coming to nothing. Slowly, by and by, they are losing whatever grip they had. You know, so once upon a time, they might have thought that they are very powerful, but it's been being proved to them day by day that they are literally coming to nothing. They are not going to succeed. They are not going to, you know, be able to accomplish their evil purposes. Um, and in fact, it's clarified in verse 8 where it says, none of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. You see, when um, before I you know the fall of Satan and his angels, at, at, at that point of time when Satan became proud and then he um, kind of tempted and, and instigated the other fallen angels to join him, they tried to fight against God. 
and they discovered that it's not possible to fight against God because they are just mere created beings. God, on the other hand, is uncreated. He's infinite. He has always existed. There's simply no comparison between the creator and these created beings. So they, you know, they really lost very badly, uh, and they were, you know, um, thrown out of heaven. So when Jesus chose to become a human being, completely hundred percent human, he chose to be as helpless as us. They thought, okay, now we finally have a chance. God, in all of His infinity. We can't handle, but Jesus in His humanness, this is something that we can tackle. And so they started to come up with this scheme. You know, the rulers of the age, this this Satan and his fallen angels, they began to come up with the scheme of getting this human Jesus killed, because they thought that if they could do that, then you know, um, um, part of the Godhead, that part of the Triune Godhead, would be would be would be dead. So they thought that would somehow cripple, you know, God. So that was probably their intention. And so they did not understand that God would use this very scheme that they are thinking of and turn it around and bring about the greatest victory. So which is why it says over here, the rulers of this age, uh, yeah, it says over here, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory. So God had a clever scheme you know, up his sleeve. And why was he doing that? He was doing it for us, for our, to help us so that one day we will be able to share in this glory. And so he allowed the rulers of this age to go ahead with their, you know, scheme uh, of uh, having Jesus crucified. And then it turned out that actually this was a very, very bad move uh, because earlier uh, only God had authority over them. Now, a whole bunch of human beings, mere human beings, would end up having authority over them. And uh, that is not something which they anticipated. So God did this mystery, it says over here, this hidden mystery. He did it because he had destined uh, us for glory. So for our sakes, he allowed the scheme of the evil one to go through. And as a result of it, now we are destined for glory. So we are now in a position of strength. Why? Because on that cross, Jesus Christ, when all of our sins were placed upon him, what does it say in Romans 8, 3? He condemned sin in the flesh. You see, he had never committed any sin. So how could sin have any hold over him? It was our sins that he was bearing. But he himself was under, not under the control of sin. So even though our sins were heaped upon him, the sin, sin could not control him. He condemned sin in the flesh, is what Romans 8.3 says. So he was able to come out victorious, something which the rulers of the age had not anticipated. So when he came out victorious, having condemned sin in the flesh, now we believers who place our faith in him and live under his protection, we too can come out victorious because through him, Sin in the flesh is condemned. We are no longer under its control. It, it no longer has legal authority over us. So as long as we were prisoners under sin, Satan could exploit us. He could oppress us. He could make use of us. But now we are not under the control of sin. So um, legally, he has no control over us. So he can only use illegal methods, maybe, to you know, try and overcome us, but legally he has absolutely no control left over us. You know, which is what is explained to us um, in um, yeah, you know that, that 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 is explained to us in other scriptures, which we will look at a little later. Um, because I think we've covered all this earlier, so you know, no point in again repeating it. Um, but yeah. Um, Okay, maybe we can just maybe we can look at Colossians chapter 2, uh, 13 to 15. Uh, if someone could please read out Colossians 2, 13 to 15. 
Colossians chapter 2 verse 13 to 15 and you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh he has made alive together with him having forgiven you all trespasses having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us which was contrary to us and he has taken it out of the way having nailed it to the cross having disarmed principalities and powers he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them in it so it's been very clearly see we, we need to understand these fundamental truths okay so um, that will help us to be very confident in our dealings with the devil so we were dead in our sins you know we were in a completely helpless condition but what did jesus christ do for us colossians chapter 2 verse 14 he cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness you know which was which was standing against us which was condemning us so we, as long as we were under sin um we were legally in debt towards god you know god had asked us to do certain things and we had failed to do that now we were legally indebted towards god and because we were in that legally indebted condition satan could take advantage of us he could gain control over us he could suppress us but that is no longer our legal status um, what does jesus christ do he takes all our legal indebtedness he nails it to the cross and he gets on to that cross and he pays the punishment so that all those legal debts are taken care of by jesus and because he did that now it's in verse 15 it says he disarmed the powers and authorities. He made a public spectacle of them. So in front of all the angels, in front of the, all the you know, uh, created beings in the spiritual realm, he demonstrated and showed that these powers and authorities no longer have any legal authority over my people, over those who place their faith in me and you know, come under my covering. These powers and authorities no longer have any control over them. So if these powers and authorities want to you know, uh, harm us in any way, they would have to resort to illegal methods. But legally, there's nothing that we can do. So, um, OK, to use an example, um, you know, um, we are living in places where uh, the, you know, the government is functioning and the law is in place. Uh, the law is functional to an extent. So no, so no, so so some you know some uh, gangster can't walk up to me and say you know I demand your wallet, give it to me. You know otherwise I'll beat you up. He doesn't have the legal authority to threaten me and demand my wallet. Why? Because I too have legal authority. You see on my side, I can say no. You know there's a policeman standing over there, and if I just give one scream, the policeman will come to my rescue. There's nothing that you can do. So maybe earlier when we had no legal rights, you know, if, uh, people who can't defend themselves would, would have been helpless. But now the law is on our side. So in the same way that gangster can't legally come walk up to me and say, you know, I'm more powerful than you. So you better hand over your wallet. I said, no, I may not be as strong as you and I may not have, you know, be as muscular as you. But there's a policeman standing over there. And if I just call out to him, he will come and deal with you. So. We have God on our side. We have the legal authority on our side. So Satan, if he at all wants to do something to us, he has no longer any legal authority. He would have to use illegal methods, which is what we see. He tries to trick us. He tries to deceive us. He tries to bring pressures upon us where we no longer can, you know, we become blinded to the facts and we start, you know, believing in wrong ideas so he tries to come up with all these tactics but legally he has absolutely no control so if we continue to renew our minds and start teaching ourselves about the authority that we have in christ he can't take advantage of us you know we can resist him by saying this is who i am and this is the authority that i have so i refuse to submit to you and if we do that he's helpless there's nothing that he can do when we resist him in that way, he will have to turn around and flee from us. You know, so um, we have high authority in God today, um, which is why it says in Revelation 12, 11, they triumphed over, you know, the adversary. They triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. So they 
uh, they they stood upon the finished work of the cross so even though the adversary was trying to accuse them and trying to bring them down they said no we know who we are we know what our status is we don't have to give in to you we don't have to be afraid of you and they used the word of their testimony they declared these things they spoke out these truths about who they are in christ and so the adversary was unable to uh, have any control you know over them uh, so um so uh, yeah so so the one main thing that we need to understand is that on that day after our legal debts were nailed to the cross after jesus finished paying the price for all of those debts and all the debts were cleared we now you know if place if if we place our uh, faith in jesus we come under his covering so now we are under his legal authority which you know uh, and he has placed that authority in our hands and we can use it in the name of jesus so we are in a position of strength it's only when we forget our legal authority it's only when we allow satan to deceive us and lead us away it's only when we go out of the protection of you know of the lord by doing something sinful it's only during those brief periods of time that satan can you know uh, have control over us but as long as we stay under god's covering we are in a position of strength so we we this is one fundamental fact that we need to remember all the time you know when it comes to overcoming the devil uh, the second point in your notes it's uh, is you know being aware of the enemy's tactics so now because he has no legal standing he is now is forced to use all kinds of you know deceptive tactics and the first um, you know tactic of the enemy which is mentioned in your notes is mind games he tries to um, use different mind games try to deceive us in the mind in different ways so that you know we will not be uh, we will not use our the word of our testimony to fight back against him uh, so what are some of the mind games that he plays with us um, one thing of course we know is you know tempting uh, that's the main in fact one of the main uh, tactics that satan uses is that he he takes our particular area of weakness and he tries to tempt us in that particular area because we know right I mean, not all the same temptations will work for everyone I mean uh, for most of us if somebody were to bring a packet of drugs and give it to us we would not even be interested i mean what on earth are we supposed to do with a packet of drugs so those are not temptations which he which satan which uh, satan would even bother using with us because we will not be tempted he will bring us uh temptations in our specific areas of weakness just to use an example you know jesus uh, in matthew chapter 4 jesus had finished fasting for 40 days and nights so for him at that point of time his hunger level would have been extremely great and so he's finished his fast he's out in the wilderness there's no source of food nearby so all he has to do is he has to wait over there in faith believing that god will in some way provide for him and he's been waiting over there and nothing has happened as yet and now satan comes because you see at that moment that is the area of weakness where jesus is overcome with hunger and so satan thinks you know now let me attack i you know jesus in this particular area so he comes to him and says you have your divine powers with you you can very well use it if you wish to it's going to be easy for you why don't you convert the you know stones into bread and eat because it looks like your father is like taking time not giving you the food which you need and jesus you know responds to him and says i'd rather follow god's word than eat the bread which you are offering so um so satan will catch us in that weak area in that area of need in that in that area where we are at that moment very vulnerable and helpless he attacks and tempts in that area he tempts us to do something sinful to satisfy our need rather than waiting upon god to fulfill that need so we should be stubborn and say no rather than we you know uh, giving in to what satan is suggesting i will continue continue to wait for god and god will come and meet my need in fact we see that right in the case of jesus as well um after satan has left and gone uh, the angels they come 
and you no know, they minister to him so they would have provided him with the food which he uh, needed so one tactic of course is temptation uh, try, here satan tries to attack us in our areas of weakness um, another tactic is uh, you know um, satan being the accuser which um, yeah which we saw in revelation 12 verses 10 to 11 where he is called the accuser of the brothers and sisters so there are usually two main kinds of accusations um one he tries to tell us that we are worthless that we don't really have much value that we are not really very very important or precious in god's eyes you know because of the way we are we are imperfect people uh, we sin sometimes uh we don't always walk in victory and holiness so satan tells us you know look at what you are like a person like you you really can't have much value in god's eyes so he uh, so he tries to devalue us and the other thing is you know outright condemnation where he says oh you're you're somebody who is always failing so because you're always failing how can you expect uh, the favor of god to rest upon you so he devalues us trying to make us look at ourselves in a very low light and if that is not working he picks on the failures which we have had and he says ah see you failed in this 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 so now because you are a failure how can you expect god to work on your behalf so these are the, in fact the two main ways that i know um, satan uses uh, in bringing accusations but we need to go back to scripture and fight satan with scripture when he comes to us as an accuser when he comes to us you know uh, in this in this um, in his capacity as for somebody who someone who's slandering us um, john 1515 if someone could read out john 1515 John chapter 15 verse 15 no longer do i call you servants for a servant does not know what his master is doing but i have called you friends for all things that i heard from my father i have made known to you so there's something that we need to understand over here jesus was not pretending that these disciples of his are perfect people in fact he knew in the next chapter what's going to happen you know in, in the very next few chapters these people are going to you know um, betray him and run away you know when he's getting arrested so jesus is aware of that but knowing all of those things about them this is what he says to them he says now onwards you are no longer servants now onwards you are my friends so it's not like as if jesus is unaware of of what they are going to do he is very much aware of what they are going to do and in spite of that he says you know what your status is not just that of servants you people are my friends and he says everything that i have learned from the father i have made known to you and you know in in that sense he will continue to make known to them all that is required because servants are not given details they are not giving given inside information on the other hand a friend is told everything a friend is given all the details because a friend is like an equal and so jesus knowing who they are what they are going to do this is the status that he gives them he says you are my friends so whenever satan comes to us and you know uh, devalues us and says what is your worth and you can say my worth is that i am the friend of god no you on the other hand are the condemned one because that's what it says in um, in uh, that scripture which talks about how the spirit has come to convict the world of sin righteousness and judgment that last portion of that passage it says you know um, it talks about satan as the condemned one so we our status is that we are friends of jesus satan what his status is that he's the condemned one already stands condemned what were legal rights he had already taken away so his status in fact is pathetic on the other hand even though god knows that we are imperfect people our sins were forgiven on the cross by him at the moment of salvation all our sins past present and future sins were forgiven so he regards us as friends that is our status you know and um, we'll dwell a little further on this concept you know when we come back from the 
uh, from the break. Uh, so right now, you know, um, we'll go for the break. And if we all can you know, log in at 11 without fail. All right. Yeah. Thank you.